Today, does the speedrun count as tool assisted if the game just completes itself? This is Checkpoint. Welcome to Checkpoint. It was Sony's state of play yesterday, and the state of the play is strong. Sure. If you like Silent Hill, action games with skin-tight costumes, and the works of Hideo Kojima. I, I, I like all of those things, yes. Oh, well, then, on your bike. Okay. Sadly, Checkpoint will not be able to present our review of newly released live service action game Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League because we did not receive a review code for the title. Eagle-eyed viewers may be aware that this is uh, typical of our experience. I don't think we've ever been sent a review code or do reviews, but the weird part is we're not alone this time. Warner Brothers delayed review codes for seemingly all outlets, and if you've ever paid attention to times when a publisher doesn't want early reviews out in the wild, you'll notice that it's never a good thing. Even if a game seems decent, the grim specter of the publisher didn't send out review codes should always be a massive red flag. Obviously, we haven't played the game to determine how deserved this red flag is, but the people who might be able to tell us are those who spent the extra money on the deluxe edition of the game, which allows players to jump in 72 hours early. Or they would if players hadn't suffered a hilarious and game-breaking bug that, upon logging in for the first time, gave them total story completion, which necessitated the game going offline until it could be hastily patched. After being offline for hours, players were able to play again, and for their inconvenience, the deluxe players who shelled out an extra $30 for early access were awarded $20 of in-game currency or 2,000 Luther coins. Yes, that's a real thing, because if naming the in-game currency after notoriously evil businessman Lex Luthor was a joke I wrote, Beach, Kathleen, and Paul would have told me I was being too blunt. We give artificial intelligence, or what people call AI, a lot of grief here on Checkpoint. And the reason is simple. AI is cheaper and easier to achieve than you think. In fact, Sega gave AI to the mass market in the 1980s, and we promptly forgot all about it. Witness the Sega AI computer, a 16-bit computer rocking 128 kilobytes of RAM, a touch interface, and stereo sound. The system ran programs written in Prolog, the logic programming language that has its origins in artificial intelligence and computational linguistics. And hey, nerds, a US prototype suggests that some sort of lisp exists, according to the boffins at smspower.org. So get excited about that. The 80s were a magical time where no one knew anything about electronics. So you could get away with writing magazine articles like the following. <clears throat> Recent advances in logic programming languages and processor and peripheral chips are making artificial intelligence applications practical in the low-end home computer market. The first product that will seek to prove this point is the AI computer, which Sega Enterprises Limited of Tokyo will start selling in Japan next month for $547. Or 4,084 Norwegian kroner from July 1986. Yeah, I looked up 1986 exchange rates. That's how much I love you. Anyway, AI capabilities in your home. Just have your child type in one or two words about their day's activities and the computer can spit out a largely coherent full text diary entry. It was the future. And frankly, thanks to movies like War Games and The Terminator, we were too scared of the future, which is why the Sega AI computer lasted three years and never left the Japanese market. Thanks to smspower.org, though, you can go read about this cool-looking device, download some ROMs, and see how it runs in MAME. What could it hurt to give this powerful thinking machine access to modern hardware and the internet? We couldn't do worse than ChatGPT! Electronic Arts has quite a messy on their hands. Hey, thanks for watching, everybody. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Nah, I don't feel like getting up. <clears throat> All right, look, EA made a huge mistake somehow, and now there's too much Lionel Messi, and also not enough.
In EAFC 2-4, the latest game in EA's FIFA franchise, but it can't be called FIFA anymore, you can earn, or win, or buy, collectible cards of specific players. And sometimes, different promotions allow for even fancier and more powerful versions of these cards to exist. And, shocking nobody, as one of the best players of all time, and on the current World Cup winning team, Lionel Messi's card from the Team of the Year promotion is, uh, real good. Tied for the highest in the game. During one of the Team of the Year challenges, a challenge which apparently was fairly easy to achieve, players were guaranteed to win a player card of at least a certain stat level, but for some reason, messy cards were being given out in unusually high volumes. This was great news for players, and was of course shut down immediately so EA could rebalance things. That mode remains offline, meaning some players got this hugely powerful card for free, while others have an equally huge feeling that they missed out. When approached for comment by Polygon, EA just pointed to their tweet that the mode was offline because of an issue. Thoughts are that EA should either disable Messi for all players or give Messi to all players. But both of those sound A, equitable, and B, not remotely profitable. This is Electronic Arts we're talking about, and none of you have considered the secret third option, where they arrange an accident and hurt Messi so badly that he plays like crap and then they can tank his stats. He works in Florida. You don't think EA could arrange a hilarious alligator mishap? It's Sonic's 30th anniversary! And if you're like him, and I've seen your feet pics, so don't get ahead of yourself, you're in a rut. When you've been celebrating your 30th anniversary as long as he has, you're bound to feel constrained by your contributions to the world and starting to wonder if you could be experiencing more. Thankfully, the scientists at SEGA have concocted a solution called Sonic X Shadow Generations. Announced as recently as yesterday, I'm assuming it's a new take on Sonic Generations, reimagined as a boys love virtual novel where Sonic leaves longtime himbo partner and Knuckles for an adventure with irresistible twisted psychopath Shadow. And I know what you're saying, Sonic X Shadow? That can't be correct. But dear viewers, it is. While the fan orthodoxy teaches that the pairing should be Shadow X Sonic, unfortunately Shadow is and has always been a teeth gritted uke, leaving Sonic's nature as at best a white glove service semi. Sega has made their official position clear in the literature since day one, backed up by the fact that these days you can always find Sonic on a Switch. Great. At least you're going to have to read all the email this generates. Yeah, I know, but I, I don't think it's appropriate to let people keep thinking Shadow is the dominant partner. That's the part you don't find appropriate. Coming up, an MIT grad student designed an array of E. coli bacteria to operate as digital circuits and glow like a low-res display so they could run Doom on it. How's it perform? Fittingly, at 300 thousandths of a frame per second, E. coli Doom runs like shit. It was the state of play. And it always feels like when we're getting ready to write Checkpoint, right? It always feels like, oh, state of play. So there's so much news. None of it's really news. No. It's just like, there's a game. And there's another game, and it's a remake of a game, Yeah, and it's another game. Oh, and Kojima's going to say something cryptic. Yeah, they might talk about Final Fantasy. Oh, guess what? They no. did, to say that they're not going to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. they're going to talk about Final Fantasy Rebirth uh, at another time, at its mm -hmm. own thing, I guess. Well, it comes out, like, in a few weeks, doesn't it? February 24th, 2024, 29th, 2024. That's what was in the game, in the original game. So I thought they would just line those two dates up or something like that. Sure. Yeah, why, why not? not? Yeah, why not? okay. There, Heather showed me a clip that apparently there's like a, there's a thing that's somebody wakes up in the in the original game and it's like, is it February 29th, 2024? Oh, I think that was an edit. That is an edit? Yeah, okay, yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Let me see. There's Death Stranding 2. They showed a bunch of footage from that. It looks like it makes about as much sense as the first one. So you, you can play cool. as the dark baby. Sure. There's like normal baby, dark baby. Okay. I see memes. I have no idea what goes on. <laughs> sure. Death Stranding 2. Um, Kojima said he's, that after Kojima Productions finishes that, that then they're going to be working on Scient, which is a new action espionage game. Okay. From, which of course was the, those are the, those are the keywords, Metal Gear. Uh, uh 
which is he's going to be directing and he's like i've been when when that game comes out i will have been doing video games for 40 years and this will be the culmination of and it's like okay Cool. Stop overselling it. He didn't say swan song. He just said the no. culmination of this yeah. career. And after this, everything else is going to be trash that I make. <laughs> yeah. Well, then he'll just have to keep repeatedly saying that he's not going to remake. He's not doing another one. And yeah. then much like uh, he's got the Miyazaki problem, right? Where it's yeah. like, okay, that's the last one. Yeah. Now I'm done. Now I'm going to go do other things. Yeah. Uh, maybe I could do one more. Maybe, maybe could maybe one more. Kojima might have it easier in the fact that he doesn't have like us. He doesn't have a, his kid working for him, you know, and making substandard versions of stuff and being like, no, I have to do one to outdo my son. <laughs> so that would be funny in its own way. Or daughter. I mean, yeah. 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 Uh, what else was there? Um, actual news. Oh, yeah. 2K pulled Spec Ops the line from digital storefronts. Quite the thing. Just surprising. Just gone. Yeah. No warning or any of that. Yeah. Um, it was there. Were, the article I was reading that it came off of Steam and people were in a scramble to get it on good old games and then it disappeared from that good old games too, as well. Yeah. Uh, and it's assumed that it's music licenses. But unlike Alan Wake, yeah. which they're which they were planning to make a sequel to. Uh, and so it was to their benefit and it has sort of a different cult status yes. than spec ops, the line where they renegotiated the music contracts with Microsoft's help. Yep. It seems very unlikely that 2k gives a shit about renegotiating the music contracts for spec ops, the line, which yeah. is a bummer. Yeah. Cause they could have just re-released it with just melodica covers. <laughs> Yes. Which is how I would have done it that's at this the, Of course point. it is. Just that's, been like, that's the option. You know, it's just like, you know, Jimi Hendrix, the Star Spangled Banner, but, you know, covered by me on Melodica. Or it doesn't even have to be me. It could have been one of the actual programmers just being like, can you fake this? It's like, I can pretend to know how Melodica works. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, why, why pay a musician to cover it? Why not just actually let somebody, you know? Anyway. I want to see Brendan Beach Deary's, like, tribute soundtrack it's like video games live except it's all melodica and euphonium covers of yeah. famous video game soundtracks he owns a melodica i think yeah, and he exactly. probably wants an excuse to buy any euphonium and charge it to the site so why yeah. not yeah i'm just i'm just imagining the halo 2 theme <laughs> right but like, like Tommy tellerigo comes out and plays halo like on stage mm-hmm. but in this case it's just me and like no 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 this overdriven melodic <laughs> yeah but like you know it has like the like the choral like oh yeah. that is just like it's like Euphonium. A, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like a kazoo yeah yeah that's nice yeah it'd be great you know if you can keep it on key yeah well. yeah I don't know. I, I, uh, the AI, so Sega's AI computer sounds fascinating. It looks hot as hell. Like yeah. I have to, I have to admit. 128 and kilobytes like, of RAM. It look all the pictures make it look like it's paper thin, which of course it's not, but you know, it, and it has the, the diagrams show that it had modules you could plug into it. So you could like multiple modules that plug in and all these sorts of different things. So this is one of kind of the nice thing about computers of that era that I guess I kind of missed that I didn't think that I did. It's like, oh, where do you, you know, because the Commodore 64 was also not a complete thing. You had mm-hmm. to have like your disk drive or yeah. your or your cartridges plug in or um, you, could, you could use a cassette drive from the VIC-20 if you wanted to, like all that joysticks and everything else. And I'm like, yeah, modern computers have a lot of crap hanging off the back of them, but we don't, I don't know what it is. Like it feels like there's so much stuff like wireless keyboards, wireless mouse. There's not... I don't miss the rat's nest, but I do kind of miss the more substantial. I have a big plug and I plug the thing in here and it only fits in here. And I guess maybe I have nostalgia for like that kind of thing. Maybe that's why I thought it was so interesting. It's just like, I just think you can shove into I it. I just think it's neat that and weird that they were like, we've made this thing with AI and you can, yeah. you know, with AI, the same sort of AI that we have now, which yeah. is to say not AI, but you know, whatever. In 1986, yeah. and you could be like, you know, write me a diary entry about this thing and it does that. And then it, I guess it didn't sell very well at that price at the time. And then... It was like, cool, we're just never going to hear about that for another yeah, however long. Decades. And then yeah. suddenly someone in Silicon Valley is like, I've invented something new and amazing. Yes. And it's like, all right. Yeah. The the fun thing about the AI computer, that uh, too, is that it's, um, oh, what was the, there was another thing. I, oh, okay. The fun thing about the AI computer as well is that it runs Prologue. 
And when right. I saw that, I was like, that is very unusual for a computer of that era, that a mass market one as well, because mm -hmm. it runs basic. It has a basic interpreter and you could actually like write your own stuff. You'd have to buy an expansion, I think, kind of like with a Famicom, you'd buy the keyboard and, and Famicom basic and whatnot, family basic. This I think, is the same way. You'd have to buy an expansion for it, I think, and then you could you could write your own basic programs. You could not write Prolog programs on the AI computer. You could write Prolog programs on different computers and then put them on the cards. I don't even know if they run on the tape or not. And then, so you had to program them somewhere else to make them for this. Wow. And I was like, oh, yeah, that sucks. If this thing can't do its own heavy lifting, then I can see maybe why it didn't go anywhere, is that if you wanted to write your own software for it, you couldn't just sit down and do it with it. I should I should add, you know, why, why did we do that story? You know, like for fun, because they just released all the, like the, the, all the ROMs and everything being available, that just happened. Yes. Like, obviously, we've known about the computer for since 1986. Yeah. But everything is now available. So uh, you, can, you can check it out. Write yourself a diary in Japanese. Absolutely. <laughs> Why not? Okay. I think it's good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.